Doctor of Integrative East Asian Medicine. And I'm going to talk to you today about an aspect of your health as your physical energy and as it can pertain to a natural process of your balance and, hearing and healing. But first, I'm going to tell you a story, a true story. I'm six years old. It's a warm spring day. And I'm running as fast as I can. And all I can see is grass nearly as tall as me whizzing by. And all I can think is, keep up, keep up, keep up. I'm in a race with our baby elephant, Mignon. <laughs> and her best friend, Dandelion, our lion cub, as we play and play the morning away. Predator and prey and a scruffy little girl romping through nature. And I remember the feeling of those days. I didn't have the words, but the feeling was harmony. Our parents raised my two sisters and I with one elephant, five bears, two lions, a jaguar, a bobcat, a puma, 11 wolves, 20 Russian boar, two giant snakes, a couple birds of prey, an emu, a chimpanzee, three spider monkeys, a woolly monkey, and too many hoof beasts to mention. <laughs> I grew up with some of these animals as my siblings in our house on a big animal farm. My actual siblings. Some of them sat at the breakfast table with me and we shared clothes. We watched cartoons. We played. Most importantly, we took care of each other. And although being raised with exotic animals is extraordinary, What's even more special is how I apply what I learned from them when helping my patients heal. So what did I learn? It's simple. That the energy of every little th living thing works in a natural process of balance, harmony, and healing. If you take anything away from today, I hope that you, hope that you gain a new perspective on how to maintain your health. And we all love lists. And I'm going to give you a list. But the list here is just the action items, the guidelines. It's the philosophy about your energy that's really going to help you. So let me ask you a question. If I asked you right now, what would be the best thing for you to focus on your health, what would it be? Would it be one single thing? It's rarely one single isolated thing that fixes it. And we do not do one single thing to balance our health or to live, so why focus on one or two when we're trying? Various parts of the healthcare industry inundate us with solutions, diet, exercise, pharmaceuticals, supplements. These are panaceas that are promoted as a single solution. It becomes difficult to navigate all this information, and so we tend to have a hard time taking action. And the system is not set up for you to not be in it. It's a business, and it's pretty myopic. So let's say you have pain in your wrist, and they want to fix your wrist, which is great. But what they're not addressing is that that wrist pain over time has led to your shoulder hurting. Give it some more time, now your neck's in pain. What they're not addressing is that that wrist pain has made it so that you can't do your job well which is producing anxiety and affecting your sleep. They're not addressing and seeing the whole system. We are one thing. We are a complex system of parts that work in unison to bring us to homeostasis, right? But focusing on one small thing with our body and our health is rarely a silver bullet. Of course, we have to address pain and illness head on, and I am not disputing that. But addressing the entire chain of our health as we move through time and space seems like an impossible task. And I'm here to tell you it's not. So now we're going to get to the heart of what I want to discuss. I want to propose to you that your physical energy is the base of all your health. I want to tell you where your energy comes from, and I want to tell you how to optimize it on a daily basis. But I also want to present to you the notion that 
when your physical health is maintained well, it has a lot to do with the strength of, strength of your immune system and also our vulnerability to disease. So it all boils down to this, our energy, how we spend it and how we build it. I came to East Asian, Asian medicine in a really peculiar way. My little sister was graduating from high school and she didn't know what she wanted to do. She told me she liked to work with her hands. So I set up an appointment at an acupuncture school so that we could speak to the dean. She fell asleep in like eight minutes. <laughs> I was on the edge of my seat. I loved what I was hearing. I'd never even had acupuncture before, so logically, I applied and got into grad school. And here's what I learned more than 30 years ago from a 4,000-year-old medicine. We have two different kinds of energy, prenatal and postnatal. Prenatal energy is the energy we're all born with, and it's finite. When we use it up, we all die. It includes genetics, but it's not only genetics. It is responsible for our growth and development and our aging and decline. We have to tap into it occasionally for some life events like childbirth or recovering from surgery or serious illness or appropriate limbic system responses to a threat, like fight, flight, freeze. Our lifestyles can take away from that finite energy, but we can never add back to it because it's finite. And then we have postnatal energy. This is infinite. This is the energy that we use every day for living, and we can replenish it endlessly. It requires our active participation. And when we're doing it right, we have enough energy for every day, and our immune systems are strong, and our moods tend to be more stable. When you spend a lot of time in unadulterated nature and around animals, you inevitably develop new eyes. You see the way nature works as a whole system in perfect balance. I was then able through East Asian medicine to apply these rhythms of nature to people. East Asian medicine is all about balanced physiology and homeostasis. And we, when we apply these principles to every day, we're able to preserve that prenatal finite energy by replenishing that infinite postnatal energy. And in my practice, I listen. I listen to my patients. I listen to anything they can think to say because everything is relevant. Anything that can come out of their mouths that they can think to tell me is part of what I need in order to treat the whole person. And yes, I treat the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. And one of the things I've learned clinically is it's rarely just one thing. It's rarely just my wrist hurts. Now, it's still important to know why the wrist is in pain, right? Maybe you're a new mom and you've developed repetitive strain injury from holding your new little bundle of joy. Maybe you fell on your wrist. Maybe you're a coder and you're using your body in completely unnatural ways, sitting at a desk 15 hours a day typing, and you're eating a terrible diet. Maybe you're a single dad working three jobs and you've developed an autoimmune form of arthritis. All of these present the different reasons why the wrist is in pain. And all of them require a different approach to healing that pain. In my work at UCSF at the Osher Center, and as I started seeing more complex medical patients, I was often asked, how do I know if I'm doing it right? It was life. Life post-cancer treatment, or after an autoimmune diagnosis, or genetic kidney disorder diagnosis, or degenerative neurological disorder. And what I found was that I was refining and refining what I told patients to focus on, which ultimately just mirrored nature. What I'm about to present does not take into account people that don't have clean water, or are struggling to put food on the table, or are facing housing insecurities. I acknowledge that this is not simple for some people. And I believe that it is a crime that health is a privilege in this nation. Earlier, I presented with you with the ideas of prenatal and postnatal energy. 
And I love a, a lecture that's all conceptual and inspiring, but also has real takeaways that I can apply in real life. So now I'm going to give you that list. Eight guidelines for you to live your life by. And none of them are new. You've heard all of them before. But I think it's really worthwhile pulling them together and repeating them now. Because these eight guidelines are how you replenish that infinite postnatal energy. And by doing so, you can preserve your finite prenatal energy. Number one, diet. We simply can't be healthier than what we eat. It's impossible. I'm a fan of plant-dominant, anti-inflammatory. I'm a fan of enjoying what you eat. And I'm a fan of eating with community. Hydration, number two. We have to stay hydrated. Our bodies are 60% water. There's an easy equation for this. Your weight divided by two is the minimum number of ounces of water that you should be drinking every day. Three, sleep. So many important physiological functions happen while you're sleeping. It is so important to find your sleep hygiene when you can. The current recommendation from the American Heart Association is seven to eight hours a night. Do find your sleep hygiene as you can. Four, breathing. Modern humans are like crazy inefficient breathers, and we all can agree how important breathing is. I am a fan of something called diaphragmatic breathing. It's basically belly breathing. It's easy to learn. It is a practice, but it's incredibly efficient. Five is movement and exercise. The current recommendation is 150 minutes a week of elevated heart rate. Elevated heart rate is the key here. If you're going through cancer treatment and walking to the bathroom elevates your heart rate, that's part of your 150 minutes. Figure out where you are in the system of 150 minutes of elevated heart rate, but do yourself a favor. Remember, anything that makes you exhausted afterwards is too much. That's not making you stronger. Six bowel movements. It is really important to not hold on to anything that's slated as waste and to not lose nutrients faster than our body can absorb the nutrients. I find what's most helpful is to tell people what's normal. Normal pooping is one to two times a day, formed stools, complete elimination without urgency or too much strain. Number seven, joy, my favorite one. Finding joy every day is actually one of the most incredible things you can do for your body's immune system. Finding joy includes gratitude, but it also encompasses play and laughter and ease and presence and fulfillment and flexibility. And last but not least, and probably the hardest, number eight, not embodying stress. This is not a statement about don't be stressed. We all experience stress. This is a statement about choosing what stressors are true threats that call for you to have a physiological response. A true threat is going to be different for every individual. But an example of a stressor that doesn't need to be embodied, a deadline. You're not going to die if you don't meet a deadline. If you need a starter point, I'm a big fan of Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction by John Kabat-Zinn. There's a perfect, natural, virtuous system that we simply need to tap into. Ignore it, and we're detracting from that prenatal finite energy. Do your best with the eight principles, and you are feeding into that infinitely replenishable postnatal energy. So how do we know if we're doing it right? We're doing it right when we have enough energy to live through every day. When we are pushing through repeatedly, it is a sign that something's wrong. It's a sign that we're taking a loan that can't be repaid. The loan comes 
from your prenatal finite energy. And no one should be living in a state of constantly borrowing stress or energy. <clears throat> our society expects it, and our industries require it. For some of us, we are not valued unless we are abiding by this culture of work stress. Or we can't pay our bills unless we're deteriorating our health trying. Or both. We really need to work to reform a system that's requiring us to live like this. If we apply these eight principles, we can avoid the system that's making us sick and promoting degenerative disease, chronic illness. Doing so just puts us right back into the system. Applying the eight principles as best you can keeps us healthier, boosts our immune system, reduces chronic illness, and in my opinion is your best, one of the best helping hands you have in avoiding recurrence of illness. So how do we do it? Let's recap. We eat well, we hydrate, we sleep, we breathe, we move, we poop well, we find our joy, and we do our best to not embody stress as we worked to reform a system that's requiring us to live in this state. Now let's recap for fun. These eight things are the good stuff. These eight things should be everyone's basic human right. These eight things should not be things that need to be checked off a list. Like eating well actually helps you feel better. And drinking water is refreshing. And when we take a deep breath, we feel relief. And what's better than a good night's sleep? If you don't believe that it can be as simple as following these basic rules of nature. I'll leave you with one more story that might help you remember. I was recently in Africa on safari to witness animals in their natural environment. As we drove through Kenya and Tanzania, I was struck by nature's raw balance. How brutal nature can be but how well balanced it is when it's just left alone. Predator and prey, living in side by side in total calm harmony, and it's only disturbed when a predator gets hungry. I watched closely as the animals took care of themselves, and it took me back to my childhood and our animals because they all take care of themselves in the same way. And what do they do? They eat, they drink, they sleep, they breathe, they move, they poop, they play, and they do not embody stress any longer than it takes to stay alive in a moment. As a clinician who works with patients that are seeking immediate, seeking immediate help to their current health issues, I offer my healing experience and my philosophy recognizing them as stopgaps in a system that desperately needs reform. Limited, but still helpful in keeping us alive and a little bit stronger. We too are nature. And just like the animals, we can return back to our basics. And in doing so, we preserve ourselves. <laughs>